Thank you very much. Good morning. Bonjour, mesdames et messieurs. Je suis très heureux d'être dans une région francophonique euh, parce que je, je vis maintenant en Californie euh, où on, on, on parle seulement anglais et l'espagnol. Et, euh, je, mon français est très faible, pues, <rire> je vais parler en anglais. Uh, just saying hello to everyone with my high school French. Um, in California, we speak English and Spanish. I've been saying por favor to everyone here, and they're very confused. Uh, thank you, everybody. Uh, this morning, we're going to speak about technology and values. I have two very dear friends on the panel with me. Mitra Naimi Solomon and Matt Weinberg. Uh, and I do call them friends. We've known each other for literally decades. Um, and we're going to be speaking to you on, on some questions that the uh, executive committee posed to us. But first, I'd, I'd like to introduce both Mitra and Matt. Uh, uh, so Mitra is currently the uh, senior director of internet marketing at Shutterfly but she's founded and led a number of technology companies before that. And uh, she's also served for a number of years on the Baha'i Internet Agency under the auspices of the International Teaching Center. Uh, Matthew, but we just call him Matt, uh, it, he was a research director at the Baha'i International Community's Office of Public Information and he was also a senior analyst with the United States Congressional Office of Technology Assessment, where he directed studies in the areas of environmental and technology policy. And he's currently uh, the director of the Baha'i Internet Agency. Uh, so now I'm going to share with you what, what we'll be talking about this morning, and, and we're actually gonna divide into three segments. So uh, and, uh, can we have the slides on the screen, please? Uh, so uh, I've just introduced everyone, so we've already accomplished our first goal. Uh, uh, I will share with you the questions that the executive committee has put to our panel. Uh, then we'll each present for about 15 minutes each. Uh, and then we'll have an open uh, discussion amongst ourselves and it's hopefully going to be fueled by questions from you. And so uh, I'd like you to jot down my email address, tofiq at gmail.com, T-O-W-F-I-Q at gmail.com, or you can send me an SMS, 415-971-9595. I will collect those uh, questions as they filter in while we're talking, and then uh, and hopefully they will provoke some good discussion at the end. Okay. Uh, Four one five. It should be on the screen. Oh, it is not advanced. Uh oh. Are you projecting or am I projecting? They're gonna fix it. Sorry. Can you advance to the next slide while you swap it? Uh, sorry, it's 415-971-9595. And I'm sure we'll show it on the screen momentarily. And, and I'll discuss the questions while we, while we do that. So the questions that the, there we go. Thank you. So the questions the executive committee put to us uh, were four. The first one was that new and old technologies alike play increasingly important roles in our lives, both individually and collectively. In what ways are the designers of these technologies influenced by particular values? The second question was, how do technologies in turn influence the values of their users? How can we be more reflective about our technological choices? And in turn, how should we think about technology design in ways that are coherent with the Baha'i teachings? And so what Matt, Mitra, and I have done is composed uh, three different presentations uh, to address different aspects of the questions here. There's, there's some overlap to be sure, but hopefully at the end of this, we will have at least touched on some themes uh, in our brief time. <clears throat> Pardon me. And, uh, and then that'll be able to provoke some further discussion. Uh, so I'll, I'll start the presentation by, uh, by addressing uh, technology in general, as well as design of technology. And so let's first talk about the term technology. It comes from the Greek word uh, technologia, which is the systematic treatment of an art. And uh, it, it speaks about art and, and, and the skill uh, designed there. And, and actually, this term doesn't appear in, in our writings. Thank you, Mitra. Uh, 
but, but we do have terms such as crafts or arts, uh, uh, reference to arts and sciences, craftsmanship, invention, and, uh, and so you'll see uh, in, in our discussion reference to those terms uh, from our sacred writings have a direct bearing on, on the topic. So let's first talk about what is technology. And uh, Abdu'l-Baha says that man is the ruler of nature. According to natural law and limitation, he should remain upon the earth. But behold how he violates this command and soars above the mountains in airplanes. He sails in ships upon the surface of the ocean and dives into its depths in submarines. Man makes nature his servant, harnesses the mighty energy of electricity, for instance, and imprisons it in a small lamp for his uses and convenience. That's a funny fit picture, isn't it? <laughs> when they first introduced the light bulb, clearly people had no idea what was going on and they were trying to light it. Uh, he speaks from the east to the west through a wire. He is able to store and preserve his voice in a phonograph. Though he is a dweller upon earth, he penetrates the mysteries of starry worlds, inconceivably distant. This is a picture from the Hubble Space Telescope, by the way. He discovers latent realities within the bosom of the earth, uncovers treasures, penetrates secrets and mysteries of the phenomenal world, and brings to light that which according to nature's jealous laws should remain hidden, unknown, and unfathomable. Through an ideal inner power, man brings these realities forth from the invisible plane to the visible. Isn't that really an apt description of technology? It's, it's harnessing the things that God has put latent in the earth and bringing them out and applying them to transform. Uh, he also says, the human spirit discovers the realities of things and becomes cognizant of their peculiarities and effects and of the qualities and properties of beings. And, and so we all have in us this faculty given by God to, to extract these properties of things. Uh, and so if you think about what Abdu'l-Baha is describing at the time he was living of the, pen, the progress of technology, it's really quite all-encompassing. And, and this is mirrored by sociologists who regard technology as essentially every tool, machine, utensil, weapon, instrument, housing, clothing, communication, everything. And so I'd like to suggest as, a, as our first observation that technology is people discovering properties hidden in nature, applying them to change our environment, and that this is a God-given ability. We all have it. Uh, so let's talk about some specific examples of technology through history. Since we agree that technology is really almost everything we've done as human beings, even though we're going to talk about high technology, you know, internet and all that stuff, let's talk, let's go back in history a bit. And, and uh, there's an expression, necessity is the mother of invention. People also say laziness is the father of invention, but, but, uh, but we as human beings, if we're confronted with a problem, we try and solve it, as this gentleman did when he didn't have a wheel. Imagine if we go tens of thousands or maybe even more years ago uh, to the first human being who figured out that fire would be usable. Uh, maybe there was a lightning strike and the forest burned next to where they were living and, and maybe some kids were playing with a stick or an adult figured out, hey, I could transfer this wood over here and it, it gives me heat, it gives me light, I can cook with it. You know, all these things become possible. And, and at that instant, the first job was created, maybe, of fire keeper because now we don't know how to start this thing but we really don't want it to go out. So, so immediately technology is addressing a need that these people had uh, against the elements. Uh, we can talk about food. Uh, hunting was a technology that was developed early on. Arrows, spears, traps, snares, all with the goal of feeding people. Uh, farming is also a technology that we've developed. The, the observation that things started to grow where seeds had been left and we could actually plant those things ourselves and then fertilize them and, and harvest them. And many people trace 
the origin of agriculture to creating free time and an expansive possibility for humans to engage in other activities. Uh, you know, the ability to create bread, for example, once you have some agriculture in place, and, and that's one of the staple that have been developed. And we'll talk about bread a little bit more later, but obviously a technology. Uh, people being freed up were able to use their time and energy for other things that were important. So for example, uh, spiritual pursuits. Uh, you know, everyone agrees that the engineering feat designed behind the pyramids was formidable. They've only recently figured out how they were able to move the, the heavy rocks uh, given what they had. But this was clearly a reflection of what was important to them, that uh, burial of the dead and, and, and entombment. Or we can look at Stonehenge and, and what it reflected about technology and the importance to the people of that time. Or the, the statues of Rapa Nui in Easter Island. Uh, and then we ourselves use technology to reflect uh, what is spiritually important to us. Of course, we have the beautiful Lotus Temple in Delhi, but it's an engineering feat unto itself. Uh, we have the, the temple in Chile about to be dedicated, and it itself is drawing on massive technological uh, achievements uh, to be created. Uh, other examples of technology in service of spirituality. This is a, a page from the very first book ever created. So paper and books are technology. And of course, uh, Johannes Gutenberg, when movable type had been created, recognized its ability to help him create something to promote the word of God. This is a, a Gutenberg Bible. If we think about Samuel F.B. Morse, of course, we Baha'is know him famously for transmitting a, a message via telegram, What Hath God Wrought, in 1844, the same evening that the Bob was declaring his mission halfway around the world. But in researching for this talk, I went back to find out how, how he came to do this, what was the genesis. And it turned out that 20 years earlier than that moment, uh, he was a painter a portrait painter. He had been commissioned to paint uh, Lafayette and in, the, in New York he was doing that and he received a letter by horse from his father-in-law that his wife was sick. And uh, he started to arrange his affairs to go and visit her. The very next day he got another letter saying that his wife had died. Now those two events had occurred days apart but because of the transmission at the time of, by horse, they, they happened to come closely together and he didn't have time to react. That tragic event for him actually created the seed in his heart to figure out a way to uh, have rapid communication be possible. And for, for 20 years he labored at it. it was, uh, he was on a transatlantic voyage when he met a gentleman who was an expert in electromagnetism and they began to talk and collaborate and that was finding out that property of nature of electromagnetism combined with the need that he had to lessen uh, tragedy by improving communication was really the seed of, of what came to bear fruit 20 years later. Uh, and of course, you know, in the, in the 30s, our guardian told us that a mechanism of world intercommunication will be devised, embracing the whole planet, freed from national hindrances and restrictions, and functioning with marvelous swiftness and perfect regularity. And it's hard for us to read that now and not think about the internet. Uh, it's not always perfect, but it's, it's getting pretty close to this instant uh, swiftness, global communication. And this, uh, the internet itself was created out of a need of scientists to share access to a research computer. So if we take these observations, and, and these are just a few uh, different technologies. There's, there's many more, of course, to talk about. We could talk about medicine. We could talk about sports, entertainment, clothing, transportation, music. All of these things, we've created technologies as human beings for hundreds of thousands of years. But one thing to, to note about these technologies is once, once a technology is created, it immediately creates new possibilities that can be built upon. Uh, and, and the possibilities can be good or bad. Um, the, the properties that we discover in nature may be value neutral, but the way we create technology certainly has a value to it. You, you saw Samuel Morse's value was communication. Um, uh, but the hunting implements that our forebears created can of course be misdirected and used against each other in violence. 
So the, the spear itself could be used to feed or to hurt. We, on the other hand, we have great possibilities created, and I'm going to go back to bread, and I apologize, my wife is gluten-free, but... Uh, <laughs> uh, so, of course, the pinnacle of bread making is the crouton. I think we can all agree on that. But it requires in that... French soup, yes. In French onion soup, yes. In French onion soup, or on a salad. And, you know, this required that first we had to have agriculture, and then yeast was discovered, and then bread was created, and then someone figured out to slice it up into cubes and fry it in olive oil or butter, what have you, maybe with some parsley. So, so that's, that shows the possibilities of technology, and, and we see them layered on. Another observation is that embedded in the technologies that are created are the interests and the purview of the people who created them. And going back to bread, uh, we can look at ingredients. Now, this, this bread is a very different kind of bread than what our ancestors created. And, and uh, you know, I, if you ask your parents for their bread recipe, they're probably not going to say, and, and I always like to add a little sprinkle of azotocarbinamide. It just <laughs> rounds it out. So, so clearly, somehow, we took a left turn and, and, and moved away from addressing our fundamental human needs and, and perhaps optimizing for something else. And so let's talk about that in the context of modern technology. This is a diagram uh, drawn by the head of IDEO to illustrate uh, what is design thinking. And, and what he said is that when desirability, viability, and feasibility come together, you can create a great product, a great experience. Now, what do those terms mean? Viability means that the thing you've created can, can be a good business. It can, it can operate within your organization in a, in, a, in a productive way. Feasibility means can you build it? In other words, going back to technology, the input is, is this, is this a property? Can we take advantage of what's been created to actually make the thing we're imagining? Uh, and, uh, and desirability is will the people use it? Will they appreciate it? Now you see embedded in this term is desire. It's not actually need. Uh, and, and so let's look at a quotation from uh, Reid Hoffman, who's the founder of LinkedIn. He said, uh, social networks do best when they tap into one of the seven deadly sins. Facebook is ego. Zynga is sloth. LinkedIn is greed. With Facebook, it's vanity and how people choose to present themselves to their friends. Now, of course, uh, you know, I'm a user of, of, many, uh, of all of these tools, actually. So, it, it, um, and Mitra will be talking about how we engage with them from, from the... But I, I'm more interested on the side of producer and creator of, of technologies. He's saying you know, that embedded in these things, and, and he's not alone. He went on in this interview with the Wall Street Journal to say, but, you know, it's okay to have a little bit of fun, it's not really sloth, and it's not really greed, you just want to secure your economic uh, uh, station. But uh, he's not the only person who said that. I've, I've spoken with investors, and they've told me they look for companies that tap into the seven deadly sins, that exact phrase, because that's going to be a big company. So we have to understand that that is on the side behind a lot of the technology that we're interacting with and that's being created. And what does that mean for us as Baha'is if we're trying to engage in technology creation? Uh, Buckminster Fuller, the famous uh, designer, architect, uh, futurist, said, humanity is acquiring all the right technology for all the right wrong reasons. And, and so if we think about the challenge presenting humanity right now. I'm going to show you something. This is a, a slide from a futurist, and don't read the whole thing. It's very dense. I'm, I'm just going to give you an image, but this is a futurist named Frank, Frank Diana, and uh, he, what he does is he thinks about technology uh, now and what he can see developing and the possibilities that creates, but also the challenges that that creates, and he's created this graphic to depict it. And, and as he sees things like automation and robotics and advances in medicine, he sees you know, humanity growing, people living longer, people becoming unemployed because of robotics. Um, he thinks that we'll need something called Institution 2.0 and Democracy 2.0 uh, to confront that human 2.0. And if you look at the things that he's forecasting will be challenged with, you see an opportunity for how we might be able to engage with technology and apply it to these needs. 
uh, as an, so what, how can we, if we're not going to create technology to fulfill the seven deadly sins, how, what model can we look at in the Baha'i faith to help us decide what to do? And to talk about that, I'd like to go back to the story of Baha'u'llah and Akka. Uh, you, after a period of time, as people became accustomed uh, and, and attracted to Baha'u'llah, they, they often came to seek his advice. And at one point, the governor of Akka came to Baha'u'llah and he said, how could I be of service? What could I do? And Baha'u'llah asked him to restore a decrepit aqueduct that had previously furnished the city. It had been destroyed. Napoleon had rebuilt it. It had fallen into disrepair. Uh, clean water was no longer flowing to the city. And the governor immediately began the task and soon uh, potable water was available to the people. If we look at this example, we see um, several things that Baha'u'llah was engaged in. First of all, he was uh, observant of the situation in the city. He was aware of the need of the people for water and that it was not being met. Uh, he was showing empathy for the people and, and he was showing awareness of the technological possibilities at the time. Uh, that's a guidepost, I think, for how we're supposed to use technology. So let me share a, a few, or not use, but create technology. Let me share a few other passages that speak to this. Baha'u'llah said, be anxiously concerned with the needs of the age ye live in and center your deliberations on its exigencies and requirements. Notice he's using the word needs. In the Tarazat, he says, it's permissible to study sciences and arts, but such sciences as are useful and would redound to the progress and advancement of the people. Uh, and he says that the, the energies that, that God has given us, um, they can be obscured by worldly desires. So the, these powers, the, the power to take the properties of nature and bend them to serve humanity can be obscured. So, so we seem to start seeing a, a shift between needs and desires. If we're using technology to serve the true needs of humanity, it's powerful. If we're using it to serve the desires, it may not be. Uh, uh, there's another passage that struck me. He said, uh, consider, for instance, such things as liberty, civilization, and the like. However much men of understanding may favorably regard them, they will, if carried to excess, exercise a pernicious influence upon men. I've read this many times before. I've always focused on the liberty part of this quotation. Yes, of course, too much liberty will be a pernicious. But Baha'u'llah is saying civilization itself, which is really embodied in a lot of our technological event, too much civilization will have a pernicious influence. So what does that mean for us who are creators of these technological advancements? Uh, uh, two more things. Baha'u'llah says, be not intent only on your own ease. So there's something, you know, we can have pastimes, but we really should be focused on something more important. Uh, and, and finally, Abdu'l-Baha says, no matter how much material civilization advances, it cannot attain to perfection except through the uplift of spiritual civilization. So we can make these material advancements without informing it with a spiritual view. Uh, it's not going to attain to perfection. I had 10 more quotes, but I cut them because I'm, I'm almost at my time. Um, uh, a, soci uh, a, a writer on the internet recently made the following observation. She said, the startup world gets a lot of flack because the problems they seek to solve are such first world problems. Many seem to be just fixated on building apps that solve the problems only wealthy young men have living in San Francisco. <laughs> and then she goes on to decry the fact that there are six apps that you can use to order ramen to deliver to your house and so on. And she's right. She's just dead on. Let's, let's contrast um, that scenario with what the House of Justice wrote in this year's Rezon message. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm speaking too fast for the translators. I'm sorry, I'll, I'll slow, thank you. Uh, they, they said the, the signs of their progress, meaning the progress of our community, are more and more apparent in the readiness of institutions, agencies, and individuals to think in terms of process, to read their immediate reality, and assess their resources in the places where they live, and to make plans on that basis. In the now familiar dynamic of study, consultation, action, and reflection that has cultivated an instinctive posture of learning. Now, the House of Justice is speaking, of course, of how we're engaged in the current plan and advancing the process of entry by troops and community development. Uh, but this model is one that's actually mirrored uh, in the technological community. Uh, this is a graphic from uh, a book uh, written by Eric Ries called The Lean Startup. Uh, and it depicts uh, a lean process, build, measure, learn. And, and 
this book and, and many others, the, the Toyota production system, have advanced a process in the technical world called the lean production system or agile development uh, that is really the, the cutting, uh, cutting edge of, of how companies function. Basically, if you're not functioning like this, you're creating waste. You know, this is the lean model because it's the most efficient. And it means you're probably going to be unsuccessful because your competitors are moving towards this model. It, it means, though, that it, it, it's, it's designed to be efficient so that you can optimize for something. And the question is, what are you optimizing for as a company? Uh, in, in this instance, uh, you know, the data that you measure to decide what to do can be data about revenue, or it could be data about how many eyeballs you're getting, which you can then monetize with advertising. So the input into this process can vastly determine what direction your technology takes. And, and so, uh, you know, as we think about how we're engaged in the process of technology creation, the input to this has to be something based on true needs of humanity, as we were saying earlier. Uh, the, the final point I wanted to make is, uh, is to share some positive examples of how I think people are trying to use technology in a way that speaks to the needs of humanity that we might be able to assist or, or, or share with. Uh, there's um, there's a, a movement in America, an organization actually, it was founded uh, three or four years ago called Code for America. And what it does is uh, creates uh, an, a, an annual, a, a way for someone to offer a year of service, a year of volunteer service uh, in government. Uh, because what this woman, Jennifer Palka, found is that at the local level, technology is very, very bad for people. For example, the food stamp program uh, in, in California. The, the website, uh, to fill it out, it, it's about 60 screens. It takes two and a half hours for someone to fill out. And it, it's, it's almost unusable. Uh, and people go hungry as a result of not being able to fill this out. And, and so she's, she's uh, enlisted the help of people in this volunteer capacity to uh, help build up uh, government, use technology to help serve. And, and, uh, and one of the people who's, uh, who's been involved in that is another woman named Lauren Ellen McCann. And she's created a movement called Build With, Not For, that within this realm saying, if we're going to create services technological technology services for people, we shouldn't build it for them. We should build it with them. We should invite them to be co-collaborators with us and understand their needs in an empathetic fashion uh, so that what we create actually meets their needs. There's another woman named Tiffany Bell who was, who was uh, someone who participated in Code for America. She did her internship there. Uh, she went on to uh, start working in industry. And one morning... She read an article that said that 100,000 people in Detroit were about to have their water service cut off because they hadn't paid their bill. And she just thought, what a tragedy that, that was. And being a technologically capable person, she started consulting with friends about what could we do. She went on the website. She found out that the government had published a 400-page document with all the people whose water was going to be cut off. So she started contacting some of them inviting them to be co-collaborators and asking them how could she serve them. And uh, what she wound up doing is creating something called the Detroit Water Project, which is a, a site where people can go and donate money to pay other people's water bills so that their water does not cut off, so that they have clean water to drink and, and shower and, and, and so on. Yeah, it's amazing. Uh, and, and she's now turned that into an organization called the Human Utility because it wasn't just Detroit that was suffering from this. So in, a, in an eerie parallel, if we go back to the time when Baha'u'llah asked for the aqueduct to be restored, we see in both instances technology being used to, to give access to water to people. And I, I think that's a great example, and I'll just leave with this final thought that Technologists can use their God-given ability to discover the properties of nature and apply them to the needs of humanity, and that this service is urgently needed. Thank you. Now we'll have Mitra. Hello, everyone. I'm going to start off with a quote what Abdul Baha said in 1912 in Denver. 
I'm sorry, Cleveland. I can't see this. I can see that. But, I can make it bigger. Oh, oh there we go. Thanks. Technology. <laughs> Through the ingenuity and inventions of man, it is possible to cross the wide oceans, fly through the air, and travel in submarine depths. At any moment, the Orient and Occident can communicate with each other. Material civilization has reached an advanced plane, but now there is need of spiritual civilization. Material civilization alone will not satisfy it cannot meet the conditions and requirements of the present age. Its benefits are limited to the world of matter. We know that technology is changing how we connect, interact, and engage with each other. There are, and I'm going to um, talk a little bit about online communities and social networks, which have emerged in the last few years, and how they are shaping people around the globe interacting and engaging and, and, in fact, impacting the society's values. And I'm touch upon some of the examples of these networks. As you see in this, um, in this picture, you know some of these networks, maybe all of them, um, the social networks like Facebook, Snapchat, Instagram, Pinterest, and then there's online communities that are uh, very popular and very impactful, like Wikipedia, um, which I'm sure you, you all know about, because when you search about any information, most of the time Wikipedia articles will come up. GitHub, which is a, um, an online community with, uh, where uh, software developers uh, contribute their code to. It's for open source software. And um, I'll talk a little bit about also a neighborhood uh, social network next door that is very popular um, in some of the neighborhoods in the United States. These online communities and social networks are shaping our interactions. And sharing some of the um, mission statements of these, um, of these large social networks this is Facebook's mission statement, to give people the power to share and make the world more open and connected. Twitter's, Twitter's, um, which is cut off here, to give everyone the power to create and share ideas and information instantly without barriers. This is their mission statement. Snapchat doesn't really have an official mission statement, but this is what they had, the, um, the founder had mentioned a couple of years ago in interviews, the fastest way to share a moment with friends. If you look at all these mission statements of these, um, of the creators of these, uh, and the companies of these social networks, they're very similar. They all want to empower people. They want people to share uh, and they want to connect the world. And in some cases, they want people to share really fast, really quickly. <laughs> so the question is, do these communities and social networks cultivate spiritual qualities? I'd say based on what we see today, their mission is not yet accomplished. There's a lot more work to be done. And this is, this, I'm going to let you guys read this. This is how maybe the values is, are changing in our societies. But the social networks today, uh, social media and the online communities are helping connect and share. There's no doubt about that, right? There's 1.7 billion users on Facebook. They share 300 million photos every day, um, getting updates from their friends. They react to their friends. 2.7 billion likes and, um, and emotions on Facebook. That's a lot. 
Same thing with Snapchat and Instagram. They're facilitating the in-the-moment behavior. I was reading an article yes, uh, yesterday about Snapchat and how it is actually shaping the way that the features that other social networks are building into their, um, into their platforms. Facebook following Snapchat because Snapchat is so popular with the younger audience. Uh, because it's so much in the moment it, behavior and lets them share that in the moment behavior. However, the conveniences that these technologies offer also give rise to bad things. Trolling, cyberbullying, divisive language as we experience it every day on, in our feeds if we are on social, in these social networks. There are increasing privacy concerns because of all the data that these networks collect and they use uh, commercially. And I know that because I, I uh, run advertising for some of the brands. <laughs> and believe me, advertisers love it. Uh, every action that we take leaves a trail of information that's harvested by Facebook, by Instagram, which is owned by Facebook, by Twitter, by every, by all the networks, advertising networks included. And if you look at the engagement on these, um, on these social, on social media, it's very limited to shallow conversations, and it really lends itself to people just quickly liking and sharing, and therefore all that information is gathered really quickly and if um, you look at the big data that Facebook, for example, has collected, there are 2.5 billion pieces of content, 500 terabytes of data on daily basis that they process, just one company. So much of our data is with these companies, the private companies, and it is, um, you know, with brilliant um, technological work that goes on in these companies with advanced advertising techniques and um, algorithms makes the targeting of these ads, of the ads that we see, very, very precise. Everywhere um, you go online, you see that you know, you're followed, um, you experience it every day. And, um, but that's how they have to do it. They, they make money off of that. And in some cases, though, the information is used by the bad actors and who can steal and uh, really misuse and harm the individuals. There are some positive, um, positive signs out there, too. There are some communities that have um, made tremendous progress. We look at Wikipedia, for example, which is a collaboration of global group of editors that have created universally accessible, useful information um, that is that keeps refreshing and they keep adding to it. And we find it when we're looking for information. It's in all different languages. It still needs a lot of work, but it's, it's, it's an amazing project. Um, and it's a nonprofit. Same thing with um, actually Nextdoor is a private neighborhood network that is very popular in some of the metro cities in the United States and it's growing. And I actually use their, um, here you see their mission statement also using the power of technology to build stronger and safer neighborhoods. They are a commercial entity, but um, they have made some progress. And I wanted to share an example of what happened actually last month on um, next door in East Palo Alto, which is a city in San Francisco Bay Area. One of the Baha'is who lives there let me um, use uh, their network because in order to actually be part of this, you have to be um, you have to be a neighbor and you have to be living in that city. So they had uh, you know, July Fourth fireworks and. Um, Independent Day in in U.S., so people celebrated with fireworks. And um, in the crime and safety um, 
you know, uh, discussions uh, on this network, um, people started talking about how dangerous it's been because there, has, there were a lot of uh, very heavy duty fireworks that were, um, that were happening within the, um, very close to the houses in the neighborhood. And, um, and then, you know, what happened was the thread started growing and a lot, lot of the neighbors started talking about it and discussing it and talking about how they have to take action and um, instead of complaining, get together and collaborate and see what they can do and come up with solutions. Um, there were lots of pictures posted in this thread. There were um, suggestions made and Long story short, and even you know, here you see um, there's a veteran who posted his picture saying fireworks can create a lot of stress for veterans. So there was a lot of um, also empathy um, within you know, that thread. Um, and this is a very local, no other neighborhood, no other person, if they're not in that neighborhood, was seeing this thread. Uh, so the neighbors were talking through this. And it resulted in the um, East Palo Alto Police getting to the source of the distribution of, um, of these fireworks and being able to do something about it. And as you see here, you know, they had an article then saying that East Palo Alto Police arrested near a dozen, of, a dozen for fireworks use, which was actually a network that was established in East Palo Alto that they got to. So this is just an example of how a local a very close social network can make an impact in um, the daily lives of people. And if you look at the characteristics of some of these communities that are cultivating discourse and action and learnings, most of, for the most part, they're non-commercial entities that are garnering a large level of commitment and trust within communities larger global community and also smaller communities. They do, um, and people are volunteering for these, uh, for the, you know, on these communities. And we know that when people volunteer, they do much better job. Studies have shown this over and over again. They do a much better job when you're doing something for free in the spirit of service. And the quality of work and commitment is much better and there is a bond and trust that advances the interactions and engagement in these spaces. And this is actually a quote from the Universal House of Justice, uh, from a letter by Universal House of Justice um, that I'm gonna leave you with, and one last quote as well. Fundamental to the welfare of the community are love and unity, the very purpose of the faith of God. I'm going to share one more. This is uh, from a letter um, on behalf of the Universal Justice, uh, April 9, 2008. It is useful to bear in mind that the internet is a reflection of the world around us, and we find in its infin infinitude, infinitude of pages the same competing forces of integration and disintegration that characterize the tumult in which humanity is caught up. In their use of the internet, Baha'is should stand aloof from the negative forces operating within it, availing themselves of, of its potential to spread the word of God and to inspire and uplift others, while ignoring any negative reactions their efforts may, from time to time, elicit. Thank you. So good morning. I um, would like to build on the comments of Mark and Mitra and um, take a broader look at some of the issues uh, relating to the development and use of technology, uh, especially how more conscious and purposeful patterns of technological innovation might emerge that are truly in consonance with the values and aspirations that we have as individuals 
and communities. And I think the value of such reflection is that it can point us to ways uh, in which, as Baha'is, we might constructively contribute um, to the various public discourses uh, concerning technology. The concept of human betterment, of an ever-advancing civilization, uh, in which material and spiritual well-being is continually fostered, implies a central role for science and technology. And in particular, it implies an evolving capacity for making appropriate technological choices. Such a capacity represents an expression of the age of human maturity. As Abdu'l-Baha says, with the extension of education, the development of useful arts and sciences, the promotion of industry and technology be harmful things, for such endeavor lifts the individual within the mass and raises him out of the depths of ignorance to the highest reaches of knowledge and human excellence. Clearly, uh, technological change is inherent to human progress. Technology, by definition, uh, as Mark uh, showed, serves to augment our capacities. And in so doing, alters the very environment in which we act. In a very real way, social reality and technology co-evolve or are co-constructed. It could be said that the industrial and information revolutions have fundamentally transformed the very conception and functioning of human society. Further, as we've seen over the past century, the relentless pace of technical and industrial uh, advancement has um, altered um, the physical environment in which we live has fundamentally redefined the relationship between human beings and the natural world. Technology is a dominant fashioner of reality, influencing social arrangements, goals, and assumptions in a way that profoundly affects collective development, individual behavior, and the ecosystems upon which we depend. In essence, I think we can think of technology as a magnifier of human intent and capacity but it cannot become a substitute for human judgment and action. So it's very important that we understand all of the impacts associated with technology. If you read the academic literature relating to uh, technology, and there's different sources of this literature, there's historians of technology, philosophers of technology, there's uh, science and technology studies. I mean, for those of you who are students and trying to figure out how can I study this, um, there are many different avenues. Um, there are actually specific fields of environment, of public health, um, even you know, engineering, uh, social development, all of these things, um, all these areas where technology is explored sort of in a more conceptual way. But one thing, one major theme that emanates from all of these um, areas is the idea that technology both shapes and is shaped by social, economic, political, and cultural forces. So, Automobiles and road networks, communication systems, and the internet are not simply technical systems, uh, but also social processes shaped by social context. Technologies can empower us, uh, but may also embody or express existing relations of power and characteristics of culture, can reinforce social inequities or pathologies, or embody ideological or strategic goals. So an example of the latter was in the 60s, when the United States was in a, a race with the Soviet Union to get to the moon. That was a, a strategic goal, even an ideological goal, perhaps. All the resources of American society were, in fact, devoted to this effort. Uh, an example, perhaps, of um, uh, where social inequities or uh, uh, characteristics of culture are expressed by technology was the apparent decision of transportation planners in New York in the 1950s in their building of highways to create bridges that had very low overhead clearances that in effect pre pre uh, prevented public buses from New York City from going out to the beaches on Long Island. So in a sense, the biases, the values of the transportation planners were embodied in the infrastructure. Technology also, in the words of one thinker, 
has become a powerful vector of the acquisitive spirit. It expresses wants or desires and feeds those wants and desires. So in many, many ways, our identity and roles in contemporary society are strongly mediated by technology. It is something we create, but it also recreates and redefines us. This brings us uh, to the critical issue of technological choice. Technical choices shape the contours of everyday life and give real definition uh, to modernity. These choices take place at the level of societies and, as well as individuals. The variety of technologies we confront, as well as the uncertainty about how best to use them, if to use them at all, is daunting. Uh, further, when we consider complex technical systems that evolve at the macro level, such as the internet, the ability to influence the overall development and deployment of these systems seem quite challenging. Yet because uh, these technical systems um, and the specific components and innovations underpinning them are socially constructed, human volition and values define their purpose and impact. So as Mark and Mitra were just uh, alluding, explaining, giving, giving different examples, um, the values of a designer or of a corporation behind a product um, are embedded in ways that may not be obvious to us. So this is quite important. Um, a simplistic notion that technology is a neutral means to freely chosen ends is not tenable. Technological advancement increasingly shapes the very moral terrain um, in which we make decisions. So I'll give you an example. So uh, one might be fetal ultrasound technology. And for those of you who are parents and recently maybe you've had children, you know the rigorous protocols that you have to go through. There's different stages of the pregnancy where you have to do ultrasounds. And it provides a lot of information that um, in the past you didn't have access to. This information actually, I think, directly confronts us as Baha'is about what we believe. Um, in, a, in, in other parts of the world, this technology is being used in a quite negative way, um, for example, in relation to gender selection. So here, technology has actually changed the moral terrain. It's changed the way we think about things. Because it has its own momentum, technological development often proceeds in a manner that is decoupled uh, from community values and broader questions of individual and collective purpose. In using technology, means and ends can be easily confused and consequently um, social goals, collective goals can be wrongly defined. So I'll offer another example. Um, many of you have probably heard of the uh, a laptop for every child initiative. And this was an idea um, that was generated by, uh, uh, pushed by MIT engineers and scientists, very eminent folks, and had the backing of some major foundations. And the idea was very simple, uh, to try to create a very robust um, computer, laptop, that could survive all sorts of conditions uh, for as low cost as possible. And technically, they actually produced quite a nice device for about $200 each. Um, and um, hundreds of thousands of these were made, and then by, and with the support of a foundation and then distributed to a few different countries. And one country was Peru. And the idea was by disseminating this, these laptops and gi giving access to children everywhere to these tools, um, they would somehow become empowered. So the results are in. They're not surprising. They're in Peru. There was no discernible improvement in educational performance. Why was that? because it was a technology-driven project. There was no uh, consideration given to how to integrate pedagogical cu curricula uh, in the use of the devices. Since then, there's been some effort in that direction, but it's an example of when means and ends got confused. So when the link between um, material needs and values is ignored, the role of technology as a vehicle for upraising the human condition becomes supplanted by a process that turns us into passive subjects rather than active users and shapers of technological instruments. Any tool can be used productively or destructively, but the most serious consequences of technology are often quite subtle. Technology itself often becomes a bearer and even disruptor of values. It can cause individuals and communities to adapt to technology rather than use technology to extend human capability in harmony with social goals and mores. This pattern um, of what's called reverse adaptation 
where technology structures and even defines the ends of human activity is a widespread phenomenon. So I'm going to give you an example. How many of you have a, sm a smartphone? Raise your hand. Wow, well, there's some who don't. How many of you check this every 15 minutes? Wow. How many of you check it first thing in the morning when you wake up? My friends, that's reverse adaptation. You have adapted your lives to this device. <laughs> now, that's for you to decide whether that's good or bad. Um, there are different aspects of this. There are apps on this device that are very useful. Um, that are based on algorithms where you can plan, make, can assist your personal decision making. I submit to you, though, that outsourcing um, such decisions to an algorithm is a moral choice. It may be affecting you in ways that you don't realize. Um, Mitra and other companies that like hers <laughs> are trying to figure out how to persuade you to do things <laughs> that you may not be realizing that, that it's happening to you. Okay? Another example is SMS, uh, texting. So it's a very useful tool. I can say, just from the perspective of the Bahia Internet Agency, we've been studying this actually and how institutions around the world are using it. Um, everybody's using it. Okay? Um, it's changing the nature, the style, the substance of communication. Um, but it also may be causing us to um, maybe displace other forms of communication that are more meaningful. So we have to think carefully about it. Um, and, um, you know, in one place that we saw um, in one of the countries I visited, um, people at the grassroots where phones are now appearing were saying, we don't like text messages because they come to us as being authoritative or even imperious. They're not, it's not collegial, it's not in the Baha'i spirit. So we have to be careful about how we use these tools. In another case, youth were using texting for their reflection about whatever activities they were doing. The question is, can it capture every, all the learning? Um, is it excluding people? Um, and again, what, what are some of the limitations? So, um, the choices we make about technology, particularly when not fully evaluating their implications, may be at variance with our essential purposes, ideals, and norms. Technology embeds values in, in many other ways. Um, technology is all about efficiency. Efficiency is good, but it can also lead to a failure to recognize um, uh, negative externalities. Or, for example, uh, the classic example is um, not taking account of environmental impacts related to technical innovation or industrial activity. Technology also emphasizes, uh, can result in a reductionist approach to problem solving, which leads to an atomistic versus a systems approach in addressing um, complexity. So a simple example of this might be, um, if we recycle um, the materials that we use, then that's really great. Um, but I think alluding to what Dr. Arbab, uh, Dr. Arbab was talking to last night, we have to go deeper. So recycling is just tinkering at, uh, at the level of the current system. We actually have to reconsider systems of production and consumption if we want to like, make true impact. Overall, one could uh, make the argument that technology fosters an instrumental rationality rather than a rationality or way of being that is concerned with overall quality of life and meaning. So in the end, um, uh, such an orientation can result in an, an exaggerated reliance on technology where it is easier to diffuse technology rather than affect change in human attitudes and capacity. So an illustration of this is that many thinkers are now coming to the, the position that we're just not going to be able to reduce concentrations of greenhouse gases. We're just not going to be able to do it. So therefore, our only option is to change the atmosphere itself. Right? We're going to counteract the warming with cooling. So there are some serious proposals for what's called solar radiation management or geo, uh, geoengineering where we inject um, aerosols into the atmosphere that counteract the greenhouse gases. Um, needless to say, this is quite controversial. Right, so this is the technological fix mentality that we have to be careful of. So um, how do we, as individuals and communities, change this? How can we be empowered to make meaningful choices about technology? How do we move from being passive technological users or subjects to active agents in constructively shaping patterns of technological advancement? Developing the capacity for technological assessment innovation and adaptation is vital to social progress. That is clear. This requires the creation of grassroots participatory mechanisms that foster a dynamic process of learning about technology. It entails the creation of social spaces 
where communities, individuals, families can evaluate technological needs, options, and impacts. Langdon Winner, who's one of the um, main scholars in the area of science and technology studies, observes that both evaluations of technology and the cultivation of lasting virtues that concern technological choice must emerge from dialogue within real communities in particular situations. The main challenge in this regard is how to expand the social and political spaces where ordinary citizens can play a role in making choices early on about technologies that will affect them. Uh, the philosopher Albert Borgman echoes this point by emphasizing that our use of technology has deep implications for our essential relationships as family members, parents, citizens, and stewards of nature. And it is necessary, therefore, for, to, for us to reassess notions of what the good life is so that technology can fulfill the promise of a new kind of freedom based on deeper human engagement. In short, we need uh, to create opportunities for reflection at all levels of society that allow us to consciously build ways of life that integrate technology into a desirable conception of what it means to be human. And such a conception cannot be dictated by pre prevailing materialistic structures and forces. Making proper technological choices is therefore bound up with processes of social, political, and moral development. Practices of collective reflection and consultation now operative in the Baha'i community would appear to be precisely those creative mechanisms needed to evaluate new technologies in relation to overall personal and community goals. Such practices move us away from simply being for or against technology and instead represent a way for generating and applying knowledge in harmony with basic community aspirations. True community empowerment and learning and the real basis of sustainability requires local communities to define their own pathways of material development and progress. So my friends, we have the answer in our plan. We have to consult. We have to think about what we're doing. Um, we have to do, at the individual level, we always we have to do this reflection. Um, in our family, at dinner time, we turn off all devices, most of the time. Um, <laughs> My daughter has, yeah, I don't know. I'm, I have to read my book on the screen. Okay, okay. So, um, but the idea is to somehow connect, right? And um, this, is, this is what we have to do. But at a community level, we need to do this. I think in Western society, I think Gerald was alluding to it previously. Um, in, in North America in particular, we have, um, they have the individual and the state, or we have the individual and the market. We don't have much in between. The intermediate layers of society are not quite there, and this is the, the importance of community. The problem is, is that um, we, um, the, the forces of, of uh, the market forces and other aspects of, of technology are, are so swift and so rapid that we can't even have, um, we don't even have the opportunity to formulate the right questions about our choices. And so all we can say is that we just have to have a strategy of participation and awareness. We have to start somewhere. So let me um, sort of bring this to a conclusion. Uh, there were some other thoughts, but I want, we want to have some time for some feedback. Um, I want to say that it should be conceded um, that the manner in which technologies evolve and are, are used is, is not readily predictable. The whole history of technology is replete with examples of how particular devices and systems were ultimately used in unanticipated ways. One example is the telephone, which was originally designed as a tool to facilitate business transactions. And that's how um, the Bell system thought about it. Um, but then uh, adaptation by users at home, the so-called sources of idle chatter, completely transformed the role of the telephone. Right? So actually it was the user side, not the designer side, that changed um, what that the reality of what that technology was. The internet, of the internet of today is entirely different from what the... Uh, military and scientific creators uh, envisioned. So we can, um, uh, through um, analysis of, from a functional point of view and a values perspective though, modify um, these tools. Um, and um, this is ultimately the, the proper expression of technological choice. Still, even uh, if we have very vigorous processes of technological assessment, and I used to work for an organization at the, at the federal level in the United States that did this, um, 
it's very unlikely that we can discern long-term implications of, of technological decisions we make now. As Baha'is, I think we can say this. We can only do our best using both reason and rational faith to continually examine how technologies contribute to personal and collective advancement. So, um, the overall vision guiding pathways of technological development and use cannot come from technology itself. It certainly can't come from Facebook. <laughs> it must be informed by our essential ideals, spiritual perception, and actual participatory practice that promote the common good. Raising the capacity of individuals, communities, and institutions in making appropriate technological choices is therefore critical for such choices express the full range of our values, social, cultural, economic, political, ethical, and ultimately spiritual. Realizing this vision is extremely challenging. Um, it's as challenging as the overall Baha'i commitment to bringing about profound social transformation. But it is not a naive vision. It is a vital necessity. It's the work of generations, so let's start now. Thank you, Matt. Thank you so much. Uh, well, um, questions have come in, uh, which is great. We've got about 10 questions. We don't have enough time to talk 10 questions. So I'm just going to pick a couple. and and. Interestingly, the questions really divide into two broad categories. One is some more questions about how we as individual Baha'is might be interacting with technology and how we can do that, you know, given the guidance and, and uh, passages that were shared. And the other one is trying to get deeper in how do we affect uh, technology creation and, and use. So I, maybe I'll pick one from each category and then for people who want afterwards, we can, you can come up and we can continue the discussion. Uh, so let's start first with about uh, use of technology. And, and uh, a couple of questions are asking, okay, well, given what we've shared, uh, you know, it's really easy to engage with social networks, hit the like button and so on. But if we're really trying to advance a discourse and have something deeper, um, how can, what, what would thoughtful engagement with technology look like in these realms? How can we thoughtfully engage with, in the social media uh, discussions uh, and someone even raises a, a question you know is there can it be related you know the uh, the Guardian warned against easy familiarity uh, so is there are there boundaries or conditions in which we can maneuver and engage in social media uh, and I'll, I'll leave it to either or both of you to share some thoughts there H how should we engage with these things what should I do every day when I log on in the morning first thing if you should, yeah. Um, so I like, again, going back to this idea that technology is an amplifier or a magnifier of our intent. So um, I think we've been given, oh, I'm going to quote Star Trek. We've been given the prime directive. Um, we're supposed to have meaningful conversations. Hmm? At least that's what I'm trying to do. So what, whatever space I'm in, I'm going to try to see if I can have a meaningful conversation. And so I have to, and I know in my Facebook feed, I have, I have relatives, I have friends, I have colleagues who are not Baha'is, and so I try to use that feed to sort of reach them. And um, so it's a different purpose. Does this mean you're no longer going to taunt me about the Broncos beating the Patriots? Well, that's, that's a special discourse, okay, yes. Okay, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Mitra, did you want to share something? Yeah, I, I, I just wanted to just re, um, read once more um, this quote, uh, just part of it. In their use of the internet, Baha'is should stand aloof from the negative forces operating within it, availing themselves of its potential to spread the word of God and to inspire and uplift others. I think it takes a lot of discipline to do this, but when we log in, and we are on Facebook, or we are taking pictures, snapping them. Think about, think thoughtfully. I mean, be thoughtful about what we share, be, being thoughtful about um, how we interact with people. And um, 
uh, basically what we talk about and what we even like, um, the content that we're liking there. Thank you. I'll just add two things. Uh, I have a lot of unsent emails, unposted Facebook posts, and <laughs> untweeted tweets uh, because you know I, I realized I was getting sucked into some sort of negative thing, and, and I had to put it aside. I, I realized my motivation was not right, and then some of those probably did get posted ultimately, which is my my own challenge. And and uh, you know, a related question here, which maybe I'll just take, is, is a, a question of saying, you know, what should we even be engaging in these things? If they have these sort of premises behind them, are we bending the nobility of the Baha'i community's pursuits to fit a medium that has embedded in it certain materialistic implications? And I think what Matt was sharing maybe addresses that, that you know, the medium themselves, the tools themselves, they may have some of those implications, but we can bend the tools to serve God. And so it, it is our challenge to operate in those spaces. Let's take one about... Um, uh, th this one about the implications of, of technology. So a couple of questions here, five minutes, cinq minutes. J'ai compris. All right. Um, so two questions here really about the, this disruptive effect that technology is having. So for example, the futurist warned that a whole bunch of people are going to be unemployed as we get robotic mm -hmm. things, right? The cars are going to be self-driving and, and people are going to not have a job anymore. So how do... We, how do we react to that? Or blockchain, the whole implication of the complete transformation of money. Banks may be you know, not existing. So uh, the question here is, uh, what, 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 how, how, do, how is humanity going to uh, be helped, or how are we going to help humanity adjust to these seismic shifts in, in, in the population? For example, mass mass unemployment or uh, complete transformation of the economic system. What are we going to do? Matt? Yeah. <laughs> the, an the answer again is that the, the individual community and institutions become protagonists and that means that they um, become aware of, engaged in, understanding what, um, what uh, first, in the first instance of defining technological need, um, assessing it, um, and generating uh, knowledge about its implica implications and its use. And so we're not in that situation now. We're uh, very much in a passive mode. Um, and um, so this has to change. I have to say, we're seeing inklings of this in different parts of the world, even with some of our behind inspired projects, development projects, where actually local communities are actually taking the lead in defining what technologies they can use to assist in their community development. I think that's the model we want to move towards. Um, and of course, you know, it's a very deep question because we are in, in a moment of great transition. So these larger forces are operating and so that's, you know, we have to uh, uh, do our best. Okay, do you want to share anything on that? No, okay. Um, I think we have time for one more question. Uh, let's, no? <laughs> C'est pas vrai, okay. Okay, so let's, let's cap it? it there. We'll continue the conversation in 